Well, welcome to uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, Design World Webinar, Solving Common Sense or Application Problems. My name is Randy Frank, uh, and I'm going to be the moderator to, for today's session. Uh, before we get going, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Mouser Electronics, uh, for uh, helping us uh, with the uh, uh, the, uh, the funding aspect there of uh, this webinar today. Uh, before we start, there's a few uh, housekeeping type items I'd like to remind everybody of. Uh, the webinar will be available afterwards uh, at the uh, www.designworldonline.com and uh, by email updates. Uh, there will be a Q&A uh, session uh, at the end of uh, the presentations after, after all three presenters finish their presentations. And uh, the hashtag for this webinar is uh, uh, DW webinar with, uh, with the pound sign preceding it there. And uh, I'd like to first of all introduce who the players are today that you'll be hearing from. I am the uh, uh, moderator for today's session. I'm the president of Randy Frank and Associates and a senior editor for Design World Sensor Tips website. Uh, our presenters today include uh, John Gamble, who is a senior staff application engineer at Silicon Labs. He is currently focusing on relative humidity and temperature sensors. Uh, Dr. Gamble joined uh, Silicon Labs in 2005, and he holds a BS and a PhD in electrical engineering from Cornell University. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Mike Stanley, and he's a systems engineer of Freescale Semiconductor, formerly Motorola Semiconductor, where he has worked since 1980 in various capacities. Most recently, he's been involved in solving system-level problems in system-on-chip integration, uh, MCU architecture and sensors architecture, as well as algorithms and product definition. And our third speaker today is going to be Dr. Rolf Weber, and he's a senior application engineer for IR products at uh, Osram Opto Semiconductors in North America. Uh, and Dr. Weber joined Osram uh, Opto Semiconductors in 2006 and has worked as an application engineer for the infrared and high power laser business unit. Additionally, he has held a position of application engineer, customer tech support, providing optical and thermal simulations and PC board design support. So with that, uh, those are our three presenters today. Uh, let's uh, get started with the first presentation of the day from uh, John Gamble. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is John Gamble. Uh, I, again, I'm a senior staff application engineer at Silicon Labs, and I'll be talking about temperature and humidity sensing and discussing some common application issues and solutions uh, for uh, those issues. Uh, I'll start out with an overview of Silicon Labs uh, relative humidity and temperature sensors, talk about the temperature effects on sensing humidity, I'll talk about solder sensitivity. I'll talk about how to protect against dust and liquids. I'll, t I'll talk some about uh, dealing with multiple devices on the I2C bus and some of the development tools that we offer for our sensors. <clears throat> In terms of applications for humidity sensors, uh, the first that come to mind are for home automation and consumer devices things like thermostats or smoke alarms where you want to sense the humidity, obviously consumer weather stations, uh, various kinds of wireless sensor nodes, and these days we are also seeing uh, temperature and humidity sensing in cell phones and cell phone accessories. Uh, for remote monitoring, uh, one of the common applications for humidity sensors for asset tracking, for tracking high value assets that are sensitive to temperature and humidity, such as uh, food and pharmaceuticals. We also see humidity sensors being used in telecom cabinets and data sensors where there's electronics in those cabinets that might be sensitive to high humidity, uh, similarly for cellular base stations. In automotive applications, uh, humidity sensing can be used for detecting when the windshield needs to be defogged. It can also be used for the uh, climate control of the interior cabin. Uh, as most people know, uh, humidity has effect on uh, comfort. Uh, also in the manufacturing process for monitoring the manufacturing environment and um, uh, in compressed air systems it's important to know the humidity because as you compress the air the, uh, the water will come out. In healthcare uh, humidity sensing is used for res respiratory 
therapy and CPAP machines and ventilators where it's important to provide properly humidified air to people who need that. Um, <clears throat> talking about the uh, humidity sensors offered by silicon laboratories, uh, this is an evolution that started out with uh, discrete uh, resistive or capacitive sensors where there was a humidity sensing element that was resistive or capacitive and then you would build a circuit around that humidity sensing element uh, to, to read out and digitize the, uh, the uh, response to that element into something that was more numerical, numerical format. These typically had a large circuit around them. They required calibration, so once the circuit was put together, the circuit would have to be calibrated. Uh, they weren't um, compatible with surface mount assembly and were basically uh, low reliability type solutions. Uh, from there, we evolved to multi-chip modules and hybrid modules uh, where the sensing element was uh, and the cir readout circuitry was uh, integrated into a module. These still suffered from high cost uh, and large size and not surface mount compatibility. Uh, and these days, uh, the humidity uh, sensing is offered in a uh, fairly standard integrated circuit form factor uh, with uh, negligible um, external uh, circuitry required. Uh, our humidity sensor is offered in a small 3 by 3 millimeter package. As you can see from the picture, it has a little hole in the package where the uh, air is let in to sense humidity. Uh, the parts are compatible with surface mount assembly, and this gives the highest reliability. We also offer a filter cover to protect against uh, dust and liquid contamination, which I'll talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> So talking a little bit more about uh, our uh, humidity sensors, uh, they're quite accurate, uh, plus or minus 3% accuracy for humidity and plus or minus uh, 4 to 0.4 degrees C for measuring temperature. They're very low power consumption, 2.2 uh, microwatts of power consumption when operated at 3.3 volts and one sample per second in the 8-bit conversion mode. Um, they are very easy to use. They have the optional uh, protective cover, which is factory installed uh, and compatible with uh, you know, standard uh, soldering. Uh, they use a uh, industry standard uh, footprint for the package, and they have I2C uh, interface, which is fairly standard. And uh, in particular, our 7013 part also has support for a two-zone uh, temperature sensor where we can measure the temperature uh, at the IC level as well as digitizing the response of an external thermistor. All these parts are made in standard CMOS uh, fabs, which ensures that they're available in high volume production and they're very high reliability parts. <clears throat> so overviewing the family, starting with our 7013 part, it's in a, a 3 by 3 millimeter 10 pin package, has a, a 3% humidity accuracy and can digitize the um, voltage across an external thermistor and linearize it so you can read the temperature both of the IC level and a, a remote uh, thermistor. The 7020 uh, one part is also a 3% uh, part. It's in a six pin package and it only uh, measures the uh, temperature and humidity of the device itself. Uh, the 7020 is in the same package and same software interface as the 7021, uh, and it's just a lower accuracy 4% part instead of 3% of the 7021. Uh, these are higher accuracy and lower power parts than our first generation uh, sensor, which is the SI7005, which is still available. The parts are uh, available in extended minus 40 to plus 125 uh, temperature range. They are automotive qualified. An optional and available with the uh, optional filter cover for all of the devices in this family. <clears throat> Talking about the temperature effect of uh, uh, on relative humidity, the uh, standard rule of thumb for how temperature affects humidity is that 100% humidity, one degree C of heating will reduce humidity by 5%. And then as the uh, humidity uh, reduces, uh, this effect reduces to zero. So for example, at 50% humidity, one degree of seating, heating would reduce humidity by two and a half percent. So for accurate reading of humidity, uh, all the sensors must be placed well away from any heat sources. 
Um, however, in some cases where that's not completely possible, if the amount of heating is known, it's possible to compensate. A thermistor near the heat source can be used to determine the amount of heating and aid in the compensation. And this is a good application for our SI7013 two-zone two temperature sensor so we can digitize and linearize the thermistor voltage. In some applications, uh, such as window fog sensing, uh, dew point is of more interest than relative humidity. Uh, dew point is the temperature at which condensation occurs for a given air temperature and relative humidity, and dew point is not affected by heating the air. So as you heat the air, uh, although the uh, relative humidity goes down, uh, the dew point does not change. Um, uh, uh, sensors of this type are sensitive to the soldering process um, and uh, are susceptible to shift in readings if uh, proper soldering is not used. Uh, this is true for all humidity sensors, not just silicon lab sensors, uh, where solder flux can contaminate the sensors and excessive heat and uh, soldering will cause a shift in the reading. Uh, the optional filter cover for the SI7013, 20, and 21 parts is solder compatible and provides protection against contaminants during soldering as well as after soldering. We recommend the use of the industry standard solder reflow pro profile with a maximum of 260 degrees centigrade. We recommend against the use of solder flux and we recommend that no clean solder, solder uh, paste be used. Uh, we recommend against uh, cleaning in an alcohol bath as this will contaminate the sensor. We specifically recommend uh, the do not use hot air rework tools directed to sensor. Typically the hot air blowing from these rework tools is much hotter than 260 degrees centigrade and that can cause shifts in the uh, humidity sensing material uh, in the integrated circuit package. Uh, solder touch up or hand soldering should be limited to five seconds per lead. And in terms of if a rework needs to be done, the, the best rework procedure is to rework with a new part, uh, remove, remove the part and rework with a new one. Um, so for dust and liquid protection, uh, all humidity sensors are sensitive to dust and liquids and must be protected. A membrane that will allow water vapor to pass but will block liquids is, uh, and dust is recommended. Generally, these me membranes are made of um, material known as EPTFE, and this is available from several manufacturers. Uh, sometimes uh, this is known under the brand name Teflon, and the expanded type of Teflon is uh, familiar to most people as Gore-Tex, but there are other manufacturers that make it. Uh, the, the cover uh, that is available uh, for the SI7013, 20, and 21 sensors is soldery solder compatible and factory applied. It has an ingress protection rating of IP67 for dust and moisture resistance, which means it will completely block any dust and it will block with liquid water up to one meter. Our particular cover will block liquid water up to 39 PSI, which is about two and a half meters. It also has an oleophobicity rating of seven, which means most oils will not penetrate the cover. Uh, the EPTFE barriers do not protect against chemical vapors. It, uh, they will uh, protect against liquids, but not uh, vapors, uh, specifically designed to let vapor through. So uh, in, in terms of assembly process, we recommend the use of low volatile organic compounds uh, uh, for materials that are used in the PCB assembly, such as underfill and conformal coating and uh, avoid, uh, again, recommend against using cleaning agents uh, such as alcohol or ammonia uh, to clean uh, even after the sensor is assembled. Um, uh, one of the common application issues that we uh, have with customers is how to deal with multiple devices on the I2C bus. Um, our sensors and many other sensors uh, in this uh, class have the option of no hold or hold mode I2C commands. The hold mode commands are more convenient because the device will hold the I2C bus, which means hold the clock line low until the conversion is complete. This avoids having to set a timer or pull conversion complete, but it doesn't. But it does hold up the I2C bus uh, for you know communicating with other devices for the conversion time, which is typically 10 milliseconds. 
If this is too long to uh, tie up the I2C bus, then use the no hold command. Uh, in this case, the device won't hold the bus while the uh, conversion uh, is being done. And then uh, to indicate when uh, the conversion is done, it basically will not acknowledge uh, an I2C transaction until it's ready. Um, most uh, of uh, humidity and temperature sensors uh, do have a fixed I2C address, so you cannot put more than one device of the same type on the bus. Uh, uh, we do have one part, our SI7013, which has a pin programmed address, so it can be set to one of two values. But for larger number of devices of the same type, you have to switch the I2C bus. The I2C bus is a bi-directional bus on both SDA and SCL, so a digital gate will generally not work for switching the bus, so you would use an analog switch for switching the bus. If no hold commands are used and care is taken not to use a high-speed bus, clock stretching is avoided and the SCL line could be digitally switched. In that, either case, you would have to be careful to leave uh, SCL high when the device is not being addressed to avoid starting to form an inappropriate transaction. Our sensors are uh, offered with uh, several uh, valuation boards and development kits. Uh, the most common one that customers order uh, is our SI7013 USB dongle. Uh, this is pictured in the lower left of uh, this slide. It's, uh, the dongle uh, has a temperature humidity sensor on it, uh, as well as a um, connection with a, a three-foot flat flexible cable where you can connect postage stamp size um, sensor boards and uh, use those for routing into uh, a temperature controlled chamber or into some other place in your equipment. Uh, and the dongle is offered with uh, a software uh, and a, a GUI for reading out the sensor values and, and logging the data. Uh, for working with our uh, uh, MCUs, we have uh, two different platforms available. Our sensor expansion board, which is compatible with our uh, zero gecko 32-bit uh, MCU and um, for some of our other MCUs you would use one of the UDP cards uh, which has a, a sensor on it uh, uh, depending on whether you're using a 8-bit or a 32-bit MCU uh, the part numbers that you would uh, use are shown on this slide. Uh, in addition to the development kits, we have a variety of collateral and software. Uh, we have the data sheets, obviously, and an application note, AN607, which is a general designer's guide for dealing with uh, temperature and humidity sensors. On the software side, uh, again, the 7013 USB dongle has the valuation GUI, and we also offer the USB drivers and source code for people who might want to integrate uh, the USB device into a system. Uh, we do again offer the uh, MCU development kits which include demonstration software and source code and we have a data logger, data logger application that also has GUI and source code available. We have Android drivers uh, and a demonstration application for Android applications and we have Linux drivers in the LM sensors framework. And all this uh, collateral and software is available at the um, web address shown on this side. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to take uh, questions later on. Well, thanks, John. That was some very interesting information in the area of temperature and humidity sensing. And we're going to change it up quite a bit with our next presenter. Uh, so at this point, I'll turn it over to Mike Stanley to, uh, to tell us about a totally different sensing area. Thank you, Randy. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, once again, I'm Mike Stanley. I manage the algorithm development team uh, at Prescale's Sensor Solutions Division. And today, if we can get this, there we go. Uh, just wanted to talk real briefly about a number of our, our sensor types, and I'm having a little bit of trouble navigating. There we go, back. Uh, Freescale uh, manufactures accelerometers, uh, magnetometers, gyroscopes, pressure sensors, and modules such as pressure uh, tire or tire pressure monitoring systems, also known as TPMS. So we operate in, in the automotive and the consumer space, uh, as well as in ind industrial. Uh, in terms of capabilities today, 
Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, condition-based maintenance. Uh, it's, a, it's a topic which a lot of people don't think about, but essentially uh, what you want to consider here is that for just about any manufacturing uh, facility on the planet, one of the most important things that you can do is maximize your uptime. Uh, you want to try to, to keep your, your production line running all the time, minimize time devoted to maintenance, uh, and one way to do that is to monitor your equipment on a consistent and continuous basis. Uh, and, and this is known by a number of different acronyms or, or, or terms in the industry. Uh, condition-based maintenance or CBM, condition-based monitoring, prognostics and health management systems, machine monitoring or predicted maintenance. All of these really essentially mean the same thing. Uh, and they all form the basis for a mature industry that interestingly enough was doing Internet of Things long before there was an Internet of Things. Uh, and, and what we're looking at from a sensors manufacturer's perspective is, is the fact that you know, lowered cost in sensors and communications imply that we might be able to extend condition-based maintenance techniques uh, to new areas if we can simplify the software side of things. Okay, uh, you'll notice we're having a little navigation problem here. There we go. Uh, shown in front of you right now is, is a typical machine that you might find in, in any type of a production line. Uh, it's composed of a rotating motor, uh, a centrifugal pump, and then a linkage between the two. Now each of those is subject to an array of problems that might include bearing failures, load imbalance, uh, shaft misalignment, looseness, gearbox faults, drive belts, and resonance problems. Uh, an example here, shaft misalignment. Uh, if you've got two shafts that are aligned, everything's going to work very nicely. But if you've got angular misalignment, for instance, you'll see an axial vibration at, at essentially the, the running frequency. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a parallel misalignment between those two shafts, you'll see uh, uh, vibration at two times the running frequency uh, in your spectrum analysis. Uh, bearing faults. Uh, this is kind of interesting here. Uh, you know, what you've got here is a number of ball bearings uh, operating between the inner and the outer trace. And depending upon where a defect's at in this bearing, you'll get different signatures in your frequency analysis. So if you've got uh, a defect that's on the outer trace, uh, we would call that the, 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 uh, the ball pass frequency of outer traces is where that should show up uh, in your frequency content. And there's a specific um, equation that defines where you're going to find that defect in your frequency trace, uh, assuming you know, a certain number of balls and, and revolutions and so forth. Similarly, if, there, if there's a defect on the actual ball bearing or on the inner trace, they'll show up at slightly different locations uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the Fourier transform of your, uh, your vibration signature. Uh, one thing I do want to note is defect signals can easily be swamped by other noise in the system, in which case you may have to use techniques such as enveloping or wavelet techniques to extract the signature of the actual defect you're interested in. Another example here would be gears. Uh, what's interesting here is, is you've got multiple frequencies that, that are at play here. You've got the speed of the various shafts connected to your gears, and then you've also got the gear mesh speed, uh, which is essentially indicating the, the frequency at which the, the individual keys or teeth on your gear are interacting. Uh, and this can get really complicated with any type of uh, a non-trivial uh, gearing system. Uh, and once again, a defect on, a, on an individual tooth might show up at a specific frequency location uh, w within your, uh, your FFT. Now, predictive maintenance is a must if you can't afford downtime. I've, I've shown figures here of a number of different scenarios. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you know, think these large windmills, uh, windmill farms that are used for uh, generating electricity. Uh, you really can't afford to have one of these things go down uh, on an unscheduled basis. It may take you quite a bit of time to bring in new equipment to repair one of these things. Uh, the, the, the top center 
photo here is uh, of a mining operation, and I've seen uh, figures of merit such as $5 million per day if one of these loaders is out of commission. So you, you really want to monitor these things on an ongoing basis. And if you can, you want to be able to predict that you're going to have a failure in advance of the actual failure occurring. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, coming slides. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the taxonomy of condition-based maintenance. Uh, you can actually break it down into a couple different areas. Diagnostics would be essentially uh, looking at uh, the, the vibration signature of machinery that you know has failed and using that to diagnose what has failed versus prognostics, which uh, involves estimating the, the remaining useful life of that particular piece of equipment that you're, you're dealing with. The idea here is that we hopefully want to be able to predict a failure before it's going to occur uh, and then schedule maintenance such that we minimize our downtime. Uh, there are a couple different ways that prognostics are, are done. One of those is physics-based, where essentially we build up a mathematical model based upon our physical understanding of the system that we're, that we're dealing with. The other is more data-driven and statistical-based uh, and, and is based upon machine learning uh, techniques. Now, I, I've, I've mentioned several times, I think, that we want to minimize our downtime. But if you look at it, if we have unscheduled maintenance, we're going to detect the fault. Then we're going to have to, to uh, do some preparation for doing our maintenance. We may have to, to have some parts sent in to us from the warehouse, for instance, or from a, some kind of an off-site uh, type of a warehouse. And then we're going to have to actually do the maintenance. So your downtime is fairly long. On the other hand, if you're doing continuous managed maintenance uh, and you're continuously estimating your remaining useful life, what you can do is you can prepare for your maintenance before you actually have to do it and now your downtime is just limited to that scheduled maintenance. And you know, because you can schedule it, uh, you can do a better job of, of not bringing your line down except when you really need to. Uh, and also notice that in this second scenario we can minimize the inventory and we can do the prep work while we're still lined up. Now there are lots of players in these fields. Uh, I went out and, and spent some time looking to see who's out there. Uh, this is a, a partial list of people who are playing in the area. And inter interestingly enough, a lot of these companies are actually in the services business. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll go out and they'll install wireless monitoring systems on uh, your equipment and then you might get a call on a Thursday afternoon telling you that a uh, piece of equipment XYZ is uh, looking like it has a problem and you might want to, to have maintenance done on that in the next 48 hours. Uh, so, so in many cases, uh, you can actually outsource the, the task of monitoring your equipment. Now, there are some standards that have come into play here, uh, and, and the ISO standard 13374 provides a standard architecture for condition monitoring and diagnostics. Uh, and this was necessary because there are so many players. It is a niche marketplace uh, when you look at it uh, you know, compared to, to a lot of other businesses. So you need to have standards so that things can work together and play together. And essentially, 13374 has defined six standard uh, blocks uh, or, or, or parts of the application that we have to deal with. And, and these are data acquisition, uh, which would include just essentially getting your samples from your, your sensors. So this is your raw sensor data and a timestamp. Uh, data manipulation, where you're extracting features from that data. Examples might include uh, fast forward transforms, uh, wavelet representations, virtual sensor outputs, filtered data, normalized data, and so forth. Uh, the state detection block, uh, might be uh, comparing the outputs from the first two blocks against expected baselines and operational limits. Uh, you're trying to determine whether or not your, your piece of machinery is enjoying good health or if it's ailing. Uh, these first three you'll notice I've highlighted in yellow. The reason I've done that is because I, I believe in many cases we can actually embed those functions uh, right at the sensor uh, using embedded techniques. Uh, but then eventually you're going to uh, connect up to, to, to the IoT uh, and you're going to go to central servers where you're doing health assessment, uh, determining the current health of your system, diagnosing fault, uh, fault conditions, 
uh, doing prognostic assessments uh, where you're estimating your, your remaining useful life, predicting faults, and then also uh, doing advisory generation where you're making recommendations to your operators. Now here, here's an example of something that we're developing with, uh, within my company. Freescale is developing collateral that's designed to s simplify implementation of condition uh, monitoring systems. So we're working on algorithms and on tools to make this easy. And I mentioned earlier, some of these we think are, are very appropriate for being deeply embedded in modules, uh, which can be located right at the machinery. Uh, so uh, we're developing uh, MATLAB utilities. We're developing uh, GUIs that will run on Windows-based systems to do some of this front-end analysis and then tie into a standard ISO compliance uh, back end. Uh, this next slide shows a little bit more detail of that particular application. And in this case, uh, we're doing vibration monitoring. Uh, I've got a sensor board with a number of different sensors. I can select the sensor type I'm after. I can select what axis, X, Y, or Z, is the sensor I'm interested in looking at. I can apply windowing functions. If you think back to uh, your college days, uh, when, when you're talking about communications theory, you'll often uh, have windowing functions. Uh, and then filtering functions. Uh, all of our FFT computations can be done on the sensor board itself. They can be logged uh, and replayed and transferred to MATLAB. And we're also working on a, a similar type of analysis uh, for our, a similar type of tool for wavelet analysis. Okay, this is my last slide. I just wanted to bring it up to let you know there are a number of locations that you can go for getting additional information. Uh, the Open Operations and Maintenance Initiative, uh, the Machinery Information Management Open System Alliance, I like to think of as MIMOSA, uh, ISO, as well as the Center for Intelligent Maintenance. And I've listed a number of references for you to, uh, to go and get introduced to the topic. And with that, I will hand it back to Randy. Thanks, Mike. Again, more great useful information. Again, a totally different uh, sensor area, but one that's uh, obviously very critical uh, uh, in, in many uh, many organizations there as far as uh, predicting and avoiding downtime. Uh, and that's, again, the second of the third. Uh, again, uh, well, a reminder for the attendees, uh, get your questions ready there, because after our next presenter there, you'll be able to uh, submit them, and we'll handle them online. But without any further ado, uh, Rolf, I'll turn it over to you to talk about uh, our final sensing area and the final sensing tools that are available to help uh, our listeners in that area. And thank you, Randy. Again, my name is uh, Rolf Weber. I'm application engineer for Osram Opto Semiconductors. Osram Opto is a supplier of visible and infrared LEDs, lasers, and sensors. Uh, in the following session, I want to introduce an optical proximity sensor demo. We call it uh, the Matchbox demo due to its compact size. We designed this demo to demonstrate different applications for ASRAM proximity and ambient light sensor. The demo can be used in standalone mode or through a GUI when attached to a computer. In either case, different application modes are possible, uh, indicated by a GUI pull-down menu or by, as can be seen here on the slide, a four-letter display on the unit. The picture here indicates the location of three of the three channel proximity sensor used for the application and a second proximity sensor used to switch between application modes when the board operates in standalone mode. So um, many, pack, many demos today come as a PC board only. So why did we package this one? There's a simple reason for doing this. One of the challenges for optical proximity sensors is optical crosstalk. Crosstalk is caused by light from the infrared LED, which gets reflected by the cover glass and reaches the sensor. In the lower left picture, the crosstalk is indicated by the blue arrows. Crosstalk reduces the signal to noise ratio and it's not wanted. As shown in the right picture, a light barrier can reduce or eliminate the crosstalk. 
but light barriers often create a non-detecting zone right on top of the class. In other words, the addition of a cover class and a light barrier can significantly alter the behavior of the system. To address this issue, this demo comes with a cover class. The core of the demo is its PC board, carrying a three-channel proximity ambient light sensor. You can see the sensor in the center of the white circle on the right side. The sensor is able to run three external infrared LEDs. A fourth LED is used, used for larger distances beyond six inches. A second proximity sensor in the upper left of the board is used to change the application mode of the board. A microcontroller on the back side reads the sensor and evaluates the signals. It also provides the USB link to the computer. Proximity sensors are popular in handheld consumer devices like smartphone and tablets. In both cases, small emitters and detectors are key. Astrom offers low profile sensors and narrow beam infrared LEDs for that purpose. Our mini midlet, for example, shown here, uh, uses a reflector and produces a plus minus 17 degree beam with a package of only 0.9 millimeter height. With the three proximity channels different Input modes are possible. The first three application modes are simply proximity sensor functions. The proximity sensor triggers at one inch, four inch, or six inch distance. This setup could be used in a cell phone to dim the screen when the phone is near to the ear, for example. Triggering the sensor lights up a blue LED located underneath the PC board and visible through the transparent plastic houses. Housing. You can see this here on the picture where the LED lights up. In order to accomplish this function, the analog sensor signal is compared to a threshold. Different infrared LED currents lead to different LED light outputs and therefore to different detection distances. The next application mode is the slide switch. You slide your finger from left to right and the blue indicator LED is activated. You slide over the demo in the opposite direction and the LED switches off. This more sophisticated switch can activate, for example, an MP3 player, but wouldn't do so by carrying it in your pocket. The slide function uses the input of two proximity channels. When channel one detects a signal above threshold, a flag is set and a timer is started. If the second channel is triggered while the flag is set, the system has detected a slide event. However, when the timer runs out, the flag reset resets. This reset allows proper function if channel one is triggered by accident. These software routines don't run on the sensor itself, but on the PC board's microcontroller. The shown rotary mode function here increases or decreases the light output of the blue indicator LED when your finger moves clockwise or counterclockwise around the sensor. Such a function could be used to change the settings of the thermostat, for example. This mode simply uses the analog output of one channel to set the PWM duty cycle of the indicator LED. In touch mode, the blue indicator LED gets switched on and off when you tap on the demo. Keeping your finger in place changes the PWM duty cycle of the blue LED. This new adjusted brightness is stored. Then when switching on and off, the demo lights up with the new brightness level. The touch mode could be used, for example, for switching and dimming a lamp. In wave mode, waving over the demo once switches the blue LED on. Waving again turns the LED off. 
In any case, it doesn't matter whether you wave right, left, left, right, or the other way around. Such a switch would be, for example, no, such a switch would, for example, allow the activation of a night light without knowing the precise location of its switching me mechanism. The wave mode works similar to the slide mode, but needs a back and forth movement. Due to the potential higher speed of the wave motion, an algorithm is used to determine the maximum of the single peaks with a better resolution than the sensor sampling of every 10 milliseconds. To illustrate such an algorithm, we show here two normalized proximity pulses. They are two milli milliseconds apart. As we sample every 10 milliseconds, it is not obvious from the maxima of the pulses which pulse came first. You see here the uh, yellow triangle and the uh, blue diamonds. However, comparing the centroid time for each pulse, pulse 2 correctly happened before pulse 1. This method, use, method uses the fact that, for example, during the rise time of the pulses, the data points of pulse 2 are slightly ahead of pulse 1. The formula for calculating the centroid is shown. It's simple and can be calculated by a microcontroller on the fly. In order to work properly, the pulses don't need to be normalized, as shown here. Finally, there's an ambient light sensor mode where the blue LED dims with the ambient light, mimicking, for example, the function of a smartphone screen illuminator. When connected to your computer, you can control the demo via a graphical user interface. Select screen values under run mode in the upper part of the, of the screen. The interface allows the user to change all the sensor, sensor settings. It displays the signals from the active proximity channels or the ambient light sensor. This way you can test new gestures. Pressing the run button in the upper section starts the measurement. You can save the measured data in Excel files as shown in the upper right. The parameter settings can be stored in the Excel file shown in the center. In the same control box, you can pick the application modes as discussed. That's uh, proximity, ambient light sensor, rotary sensor, and so on. The preset parameter values for the stored applications are set correctly when you use run mode stored values. These values cannot be deleted by the GUI. In the center of the left, three green indicator LEDs show which infrared LEDs are active. Below the indicators is an average function. Averaging of, let's say, over the last 10 events helps to suppress sensor noise. So what does the kit come with? Beside the demo, the kit includes a battery pack for standalone operation without a computer, respective batteries, and a USB cable for connecting the demo to a computer. It is available through Mauser at a discounted price during the rest of this month. To use the demo in standalone, simply plug in the battery pack and switch it on, and you're ready to go. Otherwise, you would connect the demo to a computer's USB port and run the GUI. For designing a system, this demo is useful as it comes as a complete system. It allows changes in the sensor parameter settings and program changes in the signal evaluation and gives a graphical display of the sensor readings and a light response. In standalone mode, it's a compact unit which can be easily exposed to different environments without the need of a computer. And as it has a cover class, it operates under real application conditions. The GUI, sorry, the GUI is written in LabVIEW, the respective LabVIEW runtime engine and the USB driver are automatically installed by download uh, via the Ostrom website shown on this page, on the top of the page, ledlight.ostrom and so on. 
in case you own a LabVIEW license, you can, we can provide you with the LabVIEW VI and the GUI. In addition, you can get our C code for the microcontroller of the demo board. Please contact me via the listed email contact address. This concludes my presentation. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you, Rolf. That was a very interesting presentation, and I'd like to thank uh, our two uh, other presenters as well. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to handle the questions that uh, uh, some viewers have already submitted. Uh, again, if you have a question and haven't submitted it, uh, now would be a good time to, uh, to get it in the queue. Uh, the first one's a rather straightforward one that I'll actually answer myself, and that's, is this presentation going to be available to watch at a later time? And the, uh, the answer is absolutely. Uh, uh, the one way at least that I typically get to the uh, archive presentations is through Design uh, World's website under uh, uh, under webinars and uh, you know you can look at them in different orders uh, sometimes uh, the easiest way is uh, is chronologically uh, but I know you can scan because uh, I've done these sensor webinars now for the past two years and you can still go in there and find last year's uh, sensor webinar and even the previous year's uh, webinar can be accessed uh, through the website uh, but let's actually get into some of the technical questions here uh, uh, Ralph, you just presented it, but here's one for you already. Do proximity sensors get affected by sunlight or other ambient light? In general, yes, um, but many manufacturers have a means in place uh, to reduce the effect of sunlight or ambient light. Uh, in our case, we um, um, toggle the infrared LEDs and uh, then put the result through a high-pass filter. This way, ambient light is not an issue for the um, proximity sensor. Great. There's a note, one that ties actually into you again, Rolf. Uh, what is the Mouser demo kit ordering information that uh, that users users need? Uh, the order information uh, it's available at Mouser. You can. Uh, Order it just with, with this name. If you put this name into the um, Mauser web page, it pops up. Great. Mike, here's one for you. Uh, what are the major obstacles for machine monitoring and prognostics? Uh, you know, the, the, for obtaining a fail, uh, failing data sets or development of uh, physics based models? Uh, how does that, coupled with in depth knowledge of machines and questions, uh, how does that work? Well, well, that that is the problem, and that that is uh, being able to get a, a failing data set so that you know how it's going to differ from a healthy data set uh, is going to be a problem because for for any type of manufacturing line, they don't want their machinery to fail. Obviously, you can't afford to, to let your your line go down, uh, and so that's that's a, a traditional problem. Uh, one of the things that that we're doing at Prescales, we're trying to take a different approach and and try to identify what's a normal uh, set of waveforms for, for a machine's vibration signature uh, and be able to, to put in place machine learning algorithms so that we can identify when we've strayed away from that normal behavior. Uh, so we're, we're, taking, we're taking the opposite tack there. Uh, and uh, yeah, one nice thing about that particular approach is you wouldn't necessarily have to, to understand uh, the the underlying physical mechanisms inside the machinery that, that you're dealing with. You just look at departures fr from a known signature. Great. Okay, John, looks like uh, here's one for you there, going all the way back to the beginning there. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, humidity sensors are uh, sensitive to handling. You spent a bit of time talking about that. Uh, why is this, and uh, is this unique to Silicon Labs products? or? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, the humidity sensors work on the principle of a low dielectric constant polyimid film absorbing water vapor and uh, changing the dielectric constant in, in response to the, to the water vapor. Um, this is the way uh, most uh, humidity sensors of this class work. And uh, the properties of the polyimid film can be uh, changed if there's a high temperature excursion. And also, if um, you know any kind of dust or uh, solder flux gets on onto the uh, humidity sensing film, it'll also shift the characteristics of that film. Great. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if this is a 
Okay, here's a specific question for you uh, again, Mike. Uh, can be uh, extremely useful when studying vibration to use shaft rotation as the sample clock instead of using a constant frequency clock, since doing so eliminates a, a large source of sampling variability. Uh, I guess, uh, do you have any comments regarding that, or is that possible? Uh, it's it's certainly possible, and I think it's a great idea, uh, because in, in many cases, what you're going to see is you know that's going to be a fundamental that's going to show up in your your uh, uh, fast Fourier transform. You know it's going to be there, and, and uh, if you can baseline to that and then subtract that function out, you you might be able to see uh, waveforms which would otherwise be buried in your data. So absolutely. I'm not sure this necessarily directly applies to your presentation, uh, uh, John, but uh, it says, what, what is the best type of temperature sensors for measuring uh, membrane surfaces? Well, the problem in measuring a membrane surface with a temperature sensor is that the thermal mass of the sensor uh, can affect the temperature of the membrane because uh, the membrane would have a low thermal mass as well. So you would want to be concerned about uh, the thermal mass uh, of the sensor compared to the the mass of the membrane that you're trying to measure. Uh, in, in the particular case of ours, you know, it's a fairly small three by three millimeter package, but you know, compared to some fairly thin membranes, the thermal mass could be a significant. Great. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mike, here's a, here's a question for you. Freescale's been involved in the sensor fusion area for a number of years. Uh, how does your work in machine monitoring relate back to this? Well, essentially, I've got one of the, the, the better jobs I can imagine because I get to play all the time. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've been playing with uh, sensor fusion where we've been merging the outputs of the various sensors together. But you know, essentially what happens is you get to know your sensors really well. Uh, developing a, a lot of techniques uh, that are MATLAB based, uh, learning that tool set, all of those things come straight across and apply to, to uh, uh, analyzing vibration signatures. Uh, where, where it's different is now I find myself, instead of dealing with uh, consumer devices, I'm building up boards with various motors so that I can experiment with uh, pulling out different types of signatures and, and seeing what I can do with them. Great. Ralph, here's, here's one for you. Uh, what tools uh, do I need to reprogram uh, the demo? Uh, the microcontroller on the demo is a microcontroller from Microchip. So we need a microchip programming tool, which costs maybe roughly $150. Um, you can get the C code from us, and you're ready to go. So it's uh, low cost, and uh, so just changing the C code, you can uh, make the demo do other things. Great. John, here's, uh, here's one for you. What is the typical response time of a step change in humidity? Uh, yeah, so the measurement time is only about 10 milliseconds, as I mentioned, but that's the time to make the capacitance measurement I referred to earlier. The time for the humidity to diffuse into the polyimide film is typically on the order of 15 to 20 seconds. So if there's a step change in humidity, it would take about a time constant of 15 or 20 seconds until you saw the resultant uh, change in our digital reading. Okay. Uh, look, here's another one for for you, John. Are the are the Silicon Labs humidity sensors usable buried a few inches below the go uh, a garden soil for like a, a gardening type of application? Our humidity sensors are designed for uh, sensing atmospheric humidity. They're not uh, uh, for directly sensing moisture. And they're uh, typically for sensing uh, like soil moisture, um, uh, you, you would measure the resistance um, of the soil and, and, and look for a, a change in the resistance of the soil. So our, our sensors are not designed for that application. OK. Uh... Okay, I guess here's one for you, Rolf. Uh, would the IR LEDs work with uh, with other proximity sensors? Um, that depends on the wavelength the proximity sensors are using. Uh, we are using here 850 nanometers. Um, that's kind of a standard for proximity sensors. 
We also have 940 nanometer LEDs, which become popular because they are less visible to the human eye. Um, maybe not such a big issue for proximity sensing as they might be off most of the time. But uh, you have to look at the respective data sheet, what the sensitivity of the sensor is, and then you can pick the LEDs. And yes, in most cases, they work with other um, proximity sensors. Okay. Uh, okay, John, here's, here's one for you there. Uh, how, how does the humidity measurement accuracy of 3% compare to like a, a state-of-the-art for humidity measurement? Yes, uh, somewhat surprisingly, state-of-the-art for humidity measurement is about 1% uh, humidity accuracy. So a 3% humidity accuracy is quite good compared to state-of-the-art. Okay. Here's another one for you uh, as well, John. Uh, if I have a known amount of heating in my system, is there a way to compensate for it without adding an additional temperature sensor? Uh, yes, there are, I mentioned in my presentation the rule of thumb where one degree of heating would reduce humidity by uh, 5%. So if you know the amount of heating, then you can just apply that rule of thumb. Uh, that is also covered in our application note 607, which I referred to earlier and is available on our website. Mike, here's, uh, here's one for you. You had mentioned that uh, you're working on uh, uh, in depth in the uh, in the area that you talked about, uh, uh, is there a, a timing that uh, exists for when somebody should uh, should be consulting you, or could expect to see something maybe on your website regarding information that they can uh, they can access? Good question. I think you'll see the stuff uh, coming out from us in, in in bits, probably starting in in the early fourth quarter. And then proceeding through the you know the next uh, well, year to year and a half. So you know what I've shown today is a preview of what we're working on right now. I don't have capabilities that I can I can bring to the field right now, but it's our intention to essentially uh, give the same type type of enablement that we've done on sensor fusion. So for instance, if you were to go up to uh, Freescale's website, uh, freescale.com/sensorfusion, you're going to find a, a web page that essentially has everything that you need to address that particular problem. And we're hoping to do something similar uh, in, in the problem domain of condition monitoring. Great. Well, we have time for just a couple more uh, questions there. Uh, looks like uh, this is one uh, goes back to you, John. There are are uh, any of these humidity sensors used in MEMS devices, or would you uh, consider uh, these the, the MEMS sensors themselves? Well, our sensor is not strictly a MEMS sensor. It works on the principle of uh, moisture absorption in a polyamid film. Um, I'm not familiar with any um, uh, humidity sensors that are made from MEMS devices. Okay. And it looks like uh, this could be our last question. Uh, Mike, this one's for you. Is there a classification of machines uh, uh, that you are focusing on or any particular class of machine? Uh, at this point, I'm trying to get a, a better feeling for the broad base. I think that when you're looking at very large machines, that's well serviced by the industry today. Uh, so you know, one of the things I'm interested in doing is can we take the same techniques that are used for, for you know, the, these large, very expensive pieces of machinery, and can I essentially simplify that and make it easy for us to extend that down into other marketplaces. Uh, so I, I'm looking for sweet spots, honestly. Uh, we're going to be experimenting quite a bit. Great. Well, with that final question, uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, all three of our presenters for excellent presentations and excellent fielding of questions. Uh, and that concludes uh, John Gamble from Silicon Labs, Mike Stanley from Freescale Semiconductor, and, and with Dr. Rolf Weber from uh, uh, Asram Opto. So I want everybody to know that, again, the webinar will be available at designworldonline.com and through emails. Uh, and if you uh, want to do any tweeting, you can tweet with hashtag uh, pound sign uh, DW webinar. And uh, we'd like to remind you that you can connect with the design world through just, uh, just about any type of social media uh, capability. Uh, and we invite you to uh, discuss uh, this webinar and, uh, and any other design world topic on the engineeringexchange.com. Uh, that's going to do uh, do it for for this particular webinar. Thanks everybody for listening. And again, once again, uh, thanks uh, 
to all of our presenters. This is Randy Frank saying, hope to talk to you next time.